My daddy is a hero. He helps me grow up strong. He helped me um not go to. He reads me books. He ties my shoes. And you're a hero, blue and blue. My daddy, daddy, I love you. Oh, I. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we are going to be continuing our coverage of the case of Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and Nico Watts. This will be the final video in this series for a while, as researching this case has been intense and mentally draining. As a finale of sorts, we just wanted to say thank you for your continued support. This channel has grown tremendously since we began covering this case, gaining nearly 10,000 subscribers in a single month. Being able to do this has changed our lives in ways we could not have imagined, and it's our sincere hope that we can continue to bring you content that you enjoy. As always, if there's a video you would like to see on this channel, or a case you would like to bring more attention to, let us know by leaving a comment down below, or emailing us at dreading.official at gmail.com. With all of that said, let us begin. This video is brought to you by Babbel. When it comes to researching our videos, our goal is to make comprehensive videos that go over all the relevant details in the cases. But being that growing up, I only learned English, when I've tried to cover cases from non-English speaking countries, a lot of the information is location locked. As Google Translate isn't the most reliable tool, I've been taking courses with Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world, it has been scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in three weeks. They teach you by using real-world conversations, that way you're learning what will be most applicable to communicating before anything else. Lessons prepare you to have practical conversations about travel, business, relationships, and more. And personally, being able to take these courses regularly has definitely helped my brother and I. They even offer virtual classes, giving you access to teachers who can help you every step of the way. Whatever your preferred learning style, they have a course that will suit your needs and get you where you want to go. They have various different subscriptions to choose from and offer a 20-day money-back guarantee if you, for whatever reason, are not satisfied with the service. Now is the perfect time to start learning a new language, as Babbel is offering our viewers 60% off of your subscription. Just click the link in the description box down below to get 60% off and start learning a new language today. Thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring our content, and now back to the video. When creating the script for this video, we thought about a number of ways to present the information. Since we usually cover cases chronologically, our default was to go over the crime, then tackle the aftermath. But we chose to do things differently here to showcase just how obvious Chris's guilt was, even when it wasn't especially clear what had happened. However, at this point, we will just be going over the details of how he murdered his entire family. We are choosing to place the facts of Shanann, Bella, and Celeste's deaths here, because Chris would initially lie in his confession and try to pin the blame for his children's murders on his wife. There are already so many people online who vocally believe that Shanann pushed Chris into killing her and have run with his initial version of events despite evidence to the contrary. In the comment sections for these videos, there's been a significant amount of people uncritically reporting Chris's original false confession, and we wanted to make sure that before you hear his grotesque lies, you hear the equally grotesque truth. The following audio is from an interview Chris would give from prison in 2019, after his conviction. A link to the full audio interview with the confession will be left in the description box down below, as the interview is over two hours long. We may cover the actual confession in a later video, but for now, here are the relevant details and the comprehensive story as to how Chris killed his pregnant wife and daughters. So you remember, um, I talked to you, Tammy talked to you, Dave talked to you, we're all in Colorado. Um, and so the last time we talked to you was a different situation, right? Uh, our investigation was open and your case was open. Um, that's completely different now. So your case is completely closed. Um, nothing about what we're going to talk about today is has anything to do with an open investigation. So we're not here to get more charges on you or get any statements from you that are going to jam you up anymore. Right? That's all done. So all of our cases are closed and the court case is closed. So there's nothing that we're going to talk about today that's going to get you in any type of more trouble at all. Can we talk about the hardest subject? Um, so when we were talking, the last time we talked, um, 
the last thing we talked about was where the girls were, mm -hmm. but we never really got to talk about that night. So what happened? So nothing really happened that night, at least in the morning. Yeah. It was, you know, me and Shanann, she got home like at two o'clock. And, uh, you know, I felt her in the bed. And I just felt like I didn't really, didn't, didn't, I just to make sure I looked my phone up to the and make sure she's okay, she's in there. And I could kind of feel her kind of stirring around a little bit. And, uh, she, I, I just had a feeling that she knew like what was going on. Like, I mean, obviously I didn't use like a, like an anarcho gift card, you know, that I, I did not use my actual credit card. And I, I kind of just felt like something, like she knew what was going on. And she, uh, she started rubbing her hand on me and we ended up having sex, but, uh, uh, I guess that was more like a test. Oh, I, I would have thought. Interesting. Okay. Pausing for just a moment, as this is Chris, Shanann's murderer's perspective, it's obviously going to paint her in a certain light. At the end of the relationship, he viewed his wife with unkind eyes, so the act of her getting intimate with him after arriving home from a trip was viewed as manipulative, or a test. There's no evidence of that being the case. According to Shanann's texts, she was extremely worried about the relationship. She had felt Chris pull away from her physically and emotionally since she had gotten pregnant, and she tried to get intimate with him multiple times because she believed if they were intimate, they would be able to work things out. Before she had gotten pregnant, they were having sex at least two times a week, and she thought some of their emotional issues could be sorted out if they could still be physical together. Based on how worried Shanann was about if Chris was still sexually attracted to her, it is more likely that she saw them being intimate that morning as a good sign that he wanted to work things out. But again, in the perspective of her killer, her having sex with Chris after a day of travel was seen as a manipulation. Yeah, because when we talked, uh, when I woke up or later on in the morning, like, you know, I, I pretty much, you know, told her, like, you know, I didn't think it was going to work anymore. And she was like, what happened? What was last night? You know, mm -hmm. after that, that's what it has, after I've gone through everything in my head. That makes sense. And she just told me, you know, like to get off of her. And she was like, I knew some, I knew there was somebody else. I knew there was somebody else. I knew there was somebody else. I couldn't bring it up. I couldn't just say, yes, there is somebody else. But then she's like, I'm never going to see the kids again. I'm never going to see them again. Get off me. Don't hurt the and then Is that what she said? No, because like when I climbed in bed, that was pretty much like on top, pretty much like straddling her. How to do. A lot has been made of Shanann telling Chris that he would never see the girls again. But what Chris says here is vitally important. When he woke Shanann up, he did so by climbing on top of her and straddling her. She was sleeping on her back and he had sat on her stomach with a fairly aggressive position. At some point, she implored him to get off of her, believing he was hurting the baby. Even before he had woken her up, he positioned himself in a manner to subdue her, and was well aware of how this interaction was going to go. Okay. That she thought I was going to, like, you know, hurt her or hurt the baby or something. So. Yeah. What a crazy thought. Because she knew that, like, you know, something had happened. I thought I was just trying to, you know, just check out or something like okay. that. But that's what happened. So okay. then on that night, was it just a new type of fight? It was, yeah. You never had or what? What happened? Yeah, it was a totally different type of fight. It was, you know, it was, it felt like, I don't know, it was more anger than than anything else like there was emotion to it at first and then it just felt like it was just anger it was just like you know like like there was no love there it was kind of like what we were saying what she was saying it was just like it's almost like we knew like something was combating at, at, at each other we didn't know like it was it wasn't ourselves really no. anger from you or anger from her i think it was more anger from me and more like desperation from her to because she wanted it actually yeah she knew you know, if something was right, like, you know, like, when the whole thing with my parents happened, with the, somebody, my parents called me a gate, whatever happened there, because yeah. she had a story, my mom had a story, you know, like, I don't know, whatever happened, I, I probably asked my 10-year-old nephew, 
Bobby can tell me what actually happened. Well, and they both have their feelings for good reasons, and they both didn't see it the other person's way. And Yeah. And, like, maybe I... Cause I, could, I didn't talk to my parents from then on until, like, August 6th. And, like, you know, my dad took that whole week off. Well, you didn't talk to your parents from then on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, like, my Shanann was like, do not talk to them, do not call them, do not do anything. Is that what she said? Yeah. And uh, the uh, CeCe's birthday was 17th, but I think the actual birthday party was, like, a couple days after. In August? July. In July. Yeah. And, uh, like, my, my mom or my dad was going to go, but then there was, like, a post on Facebook about, you know, allergies and stuff like that she had made. And I was like, no, I just can't can't do it anymore. And just, like, just... He, per- he perceived that as her taking a shot type thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like she always says she never, you know, put those posts uh, directed at anybody, but I, like, she, she had a method. If you read them, you know who that term yeah. was talking about. She had a method to the badness, mm-hmm. and you can see it. Mm-hmm. But uh, as I wish I could have just took more time just to fix that. Yeah. Like, I was, like, I wanted my parents to be involved. Like, since, you know, like the whole wedding thing, and then up to that, it was like, you know, my mom, my sister were always like, you know, combating with Shan, Shan combating with them. Mm-hmm. My dad was always cool. Like, he's just like me, he's just like, you know, go with flow. Like, I just want everybody to do a long time deal. Chicks, man. I love your dad. Oh, he's the best. Mm-hmm. Isn't he? I so, loved your dad. I'm sorry, keep going. That's cool. Um, I just wish I could have, like, just when we were in, uh, we were at the beach in August. Like, my dad was supposed to let's take the whole week off just so we could see the kids and, like, uh, see me and, like, grab a cook out of my sister's house or something. And then, but we just pretty much spent five days at the beach and Shenan had, like, booked it. So, like, you know, I mean, it's, I don't want to say, like, punishment for them not to see the kids, but, like, I wanted them to see it. Mm-hmm. See them. You know, just, I wish I could have fixed it all, fixed all that. And I, I even, like, when I was at the beach, I told Shenan that, it was more like, like what was going on was more of like, I feel like, you know, because my dad's here, I feel like I've lost like something in my life I haven't been talked of for three weeks. Mm-hmm. I have been seeing, seeing the kids for three weeks, you know, FaceTime or anything. Mm-hmm. And I wanted them to be able to have that relationship. And, and they, she was pretty much gone home and like she tried to kill my daughter by giving her pink. I was like, that's, I, was like I don't think she gave to her. <laughs> and that was that her stance is that your mom. Put that, put something in front of CC, Like to kill her or no, just, just, to... just like, like, didn't care. like, like, didn't pay attention. She, she thinks that allergies and like this state of age is like people think, oh, you're like fine. it's made up. Like, kind it'll, of thing. Yeah, you'll be fine. You'll just have a rash. You'll be fine. Mm-hmm. I've seen CC, you know, like the first time, well, I've seen a picture of when he had a cast the first time. I looked at and then she had kiwi the second time, and then the same thing happened. Chris is attempting to defend his mother here and say that Nutgate, as they referred to it, was not intentional, but he then negates that by stating that Cindy, quote, doesn't believe in allergies, unquote, and thought Cece would be fine if she did have nuts. That directly validates Shanann's version of events and her fears around leaving the girls with his parents. Cindy didn't believe Shanann had any chronic illness and was faking her lupus and fibromyalgia. She believed that Shanann was lying about her daughter's allergies because she needed attention. And when Shanann asked her to make sure there was no food in the Watts' home that contained tree nuts, Cindy lied to her and claimed she had done so when she hadn't. Cindy misguidedly assumed that Cece wasn't actually allergic to tree nuts, and even if she was, it probably wasn't that bad. Her not believing in allergies could have gotten Cece killed. And just because it was something that Chris was able to shrug off, Shanann was not wrong for not wanting her daughters to be in that environment again. Moreover, there have been multiple instances of grandparents like Cindy not taking their grandchildren's allergies or ailments seriously, and directly causing their deaths. Even if it was accidental, Cindy had enough information to know that she was putting her granddaughter in danger, and she was either too blinded by her dislike of Shanann to take her words seriously, or she simply didn't care. So then, I know I keep bringing it up. Can you walk me through that's just the last few minutes before Shenanda? It was pretty much just, like, I had gotten dressed for work, and then, like, we started talking. Did she come to you? No, I was, I was just right there in bed. Oh, just, okay. Yeah, so I was just like, I got my blue shirt on, my jeans and everything. You ready to go? I was 
ready to go. And was she asleep, or did did you have to wake her up to finish your conversation? Or? I don't wake her up because like she 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 got home like two o'clock, so she was pretty much out of it. But I never knew like if like if her plane got delayed. Someone someone always told me like she just like sat around with Nicole, and just like talked for a while, and then came home for plane. I'm not sure if that yeah, was just cool. it was delayed. Yeah, yeah. but um, uh, you know, when she came home and everything, but yeah. Like I, I, I will grow up to talk to her. Oh, okay. Yeah. And is that because it was just eating at your? Yeah. Like I, I knew like you know, something like it's something that just felt right with me. So I know like she knew. I'm. I just. I just knew she. Knew. I just felt like maybe like, maybe the kids weren't going to be there when I got home that day. Oh, interesting. Now, um, I don't mean to offend, but I have to ask: Is that really the truth? I really felt like they were they weren't gonna be there when I got home that day. Oh, and like so, she would take them somewhere? No, I just, I just I just felt like either maybe I wouldn't go home, maybe they weren't gonna be there, or I would be allowed in. And they weren't there because he killed them. To be clear, Chris did not care if he saw his children again. And Shanann saying this to him wasn't the slap in the face he's making it out to be. He had told Shanann directly that he didn't want her to give birth again, even though she was pregnant. He no longer wanted to be a father, and, more importantly, he went on to kill his daughters. This narrative framing is being done for one reason, and that is to paint Shanann as the aggressor, the person who pushed Chris past his limits. Sure, he was the one cheating on her and leaving her early in her pregnancy to be with a younger woman, but she told him he would never see his kids again. So when he killed her, it was somehow deserved. He only killed her because she was trying to take his children away from him. But then he went on to kill the girls. His statement loses all credibility when you realize he never cared if he saw his girls again. Because he ensured that that would happen. He was laughing and smiling, texting his mistress, directly after the murders. Truly believing he was going to be living it up with her while his family's bodies decomposed at his work site. Also, just as a reminder, when she told him he would never see the girls again, he was still straddling her, pinning her down in an extremely dominating position. He already knew he was going to kill her at that point. Yeah, it was, and no, nothing, nothing about that conversation. I just wish I could take all of that. Just be, just the, the whole neck thing back, everything. But so then when did it turn? As far as that conversation? Mm -hmm. Just at the end when I was telling her, like, Told her I didn't love her anymore. And that's what happened. What happened? Somebody get off her and that's what happened. Uh, okay. Did you say she said something like that you were hurting the baby or something? So that was before that. Because like when I was straddling her, it was kind of like around her waist type deal. Why did you get on her like that? I just when we got off when we got on the bed. I just, that's just what I got on. Is that so she would listen to you? I felt like she could probably listen to me just laying beside her, but I got on top of her. Mm -hmm. And every time I think about it, I'm just like, did I know I was going to do that before I got on top of her? Really? That's an interesting thought, Chris. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you knew. It's like the whole, everything that happened that morning, I, just, I don't know. Like, like, I try to go back in my head. I'm just like, I didn't want to do this, but I did it. Just everything just kind of like felt like you had to. It just felt like it was. I don't even want to say it, it felt like I had to. It just felt like there was already something in my mind that I was complaining that I was going to do it, and I woke up that morning it was going to happen, and I had no control of it. You never thought about it before. It was just like I don't want, like when, like like you said, like in the sentencing hearing that the prosecutor said it takes two to four minutes, something like that to happen. Like, why, why can't I just let go? Oh, that's interesting. Can I just let go? Feeling like it was in motion and you just couldn't stop it? Yeah, it was just like, I don't even want to know what, what she saw when she looked back at me, honestly. Did you look at her? What was she doing? Why do you think she wasn't fighting? Uh, maybe she was praying. Maybe she was just. I read, read the Bible. It said, you know, like you know, uh, the scripture says, "Don't uh, uh, forgive these people, for they do not know what they do." Mm -hmm. um, maybe she was saying that. I don't know what she was saying in her head, but she. Shanann wasn't thinking that. While she can never truly know what she was thinking, 
When he was straddling her, based on who Shanann was, she likely didn't expect Chris to actually kill her. There was no evidence of him hurting her prior to this event, so she might have expected him to stop. She was also chronically ill, and had been unable to eat and take care of herself in the days prior to the murder. She had slept for maybe an hour or two when Chris killed her, making it unlikely that she would have been able to defend herself, even if she wanted to. But she wasn't silently praying for God to forgive Chris for murdering her, as he was doing so. That is a wildly inappropriate and frankly vile thing to say. You know, like, like when you guys told me to take off your shirt and step check for defensive wounds, and like, you know, there wasn't going to be any. She didn't fight, even I don't know like, why. It's like she didn't grab, could she grab your arms, or were her arms pinned down, or? Not, not that I remember, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think, like, I moved toward my knees or, or around her arms or anything, but it was just kind of like when I got on top of her, we, we started talking, at least that was it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like in my head, or like in the back of my head, that was going to happen. And just like at the end of the conversation, it was just like, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. I just wish I could have let go. Did it seem like it was that long, two to four minutes? How long did it seem for you? Almost kind of felt like it was, felt like it was longer almost, because it felt like time was standing still. It's kind of like I just saw my life just disappearing before my eyes, but it just like I couldn't let go. It was like somebody else, like, like if you picture somebody else around you, holding your hands, holding you, keep you from not, not letting go. some point there was a statement about rage. Do you feel like you're in a rage at that point? How do you, yeah, how do that's the only way I can describe it, honestly. Like a snap or something. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I guess my attorney had said, like, some, you know, you know, strangulation. It's more of like a, I don't know, passionate type thing. I'm just like, I don't know how that could be passionate. It's just intimate because you're right in there. Yeah. Use in your own hands. It's a lot different than someone standing across the room and you shooting them or something like that. So, I just, I just felt like somebody was like behind me, just like just mm-hmm. I just couldn't let go. It's interesting to me because there was a lot of things in your life that were like that, right? Where you're just like maybe felt out of control or maybe felt like I don't know why I couldn't stick, take a step back or you know, like even when you said when your buddy was like, "Let's go to the football game." You wanted to say yes, he could. Yeah, I wanted to. Like I, I've never been. I've been to a football game since North Carolina, so I was just like, yeah, sure. Like, just, I wanted to say that. Yeah. I wanted to just, just text me, yeah, you know, maybe it fell through. We can't go. So, then what? Um, After, you know, Shanann was, I guess, once, it, once I was, once she was gone, it was just like, I, I didn't, didn't know what, what was going on. It's like, there was like a traumatic, I don't know what you call it, traumatic event type and everything. And like, I was shaking. I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I had done. I still wasn't in that right state of mind. I don't think like, like I was in control of what I could think or what I could do at that point in time. Like most people say, like, why don't you just call 911? Why don't you like, unless you're in that situation, you don't, you you don't, don't know. You don't know what you would have done. Mm-hmm. It's easy to play Monday morning quarterback. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Like, like you said, if somebody shoots somebody, you don't know what they're going through in mind at that point in time. Mm-hmm. You don't know what you've done. So what happened next? Bella came in. Is that what happened? Bella came in. Bella came out twice that time just because she knew like Shannon was coming home. If like, I told her like, all right, she'll be home Monday, mm-hmm. type thing, because like Shannon's not going to just go in there and wake her up at like in the middle of the night, type mm-hmm. thing. So like I told her she'd be home and she knew like wake up. yeah she knew like are you time yet like she comes out like she home yet like no baby just when you wake up 
Okay, when you wake up, so okay. About two, about two times she came out asking about that, but Celeste hasn't. She hasn't done that yet. In the last interview, we discussed how Chris laughed and joked about how Bella missed her mom so much she kept coming into the bedroom to ask him when she was coming home that night. It was a funny aside at the time, displaying how much she loved and missed Shanann. But that morning, after Chris had strangled the life out of his wife, the four-year-old walked in to see what he had done. What she said. Mom? Mom? Did she hear something? Is that what she called? Absolutely nothing. Okay. What'd you tell her? Mommy, I'll go good. And then... Um, did that happen with Bella right in that room? Not in front of her. Yeah. What happened? She was locked in as, you know, she thought, you know, she was, she was sleeping. Mm -hmm. Did you take her back to her room? I put she had in that sheet that she found inside. Okay. Good yeah. luck. Carried her downstairs and backed my truck up. At that point, were the girls still there? Okay. So that Shanann's in the truck and went back to the house. We got her by back in the truck. It was Bella first or was Cece first? In the truck? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. So Shanann was first and then Bella was next. Was Bella alive when you put her, when you guys got in the truck? Oh, okay. What happened? I looked back up. Okay. I don't really want to talk about this part, honestly. So you put Shanann in the truck and then you put the two girls in the truck? Were they just sitting in their car seats, or, or I guess they didn't probably have car no, seats in your not, truck, did not, they? Not, yeah, just, just sitting in the back with the, like in that that bench. And so Shanann was back there too. Is that on the floor. What did they say about Shanann being on the floor? Mommy, okay. What'd you tell them? She'll be fine. Did you have your their stuff with them, like their toys and their blankets and stuff? They had they had some they had something with them that they carried. One of them, I think, at like CC and Bella had like a blanket or something with them, mm -hmm. like a pink, a pink blanket. Or... What about the dog? I think one of them had a dog, right? That talked or it's a dog. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, one of them had like a little barking dog. Yeah. Was that with you too? Do you know? I think it was. Try to, try to, it's hard to remember, like, yeah. if they had, like, the big blanket, small blanket. So, I think I saw, um, on the video that you put a gas can or something in the back of your truck. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Did you have different plans uh, when you put that in there? I don't know what was going through my head. I feel like I, maybe I could just get rid of myself at the same time if I was doing all this. Honestly. Yeah. Did you think about that? What would you think about that? I felt like I deserved to live after what had happened. That is factually inaccurate. If Chris didn't have the will to live, he, like the majority of family annihilators, would have killed himself after the murders. But he wanted to live. He wanted to run off into the sunset with his new girlfriend and start fresh, making it appear that his wife had taken their children and left him in the lurch. So what happened when you got out there? I took Shanann out. Just to place off to the site. Mm -hmm. And then... What were the girls doing when you were doing that? Just sent them back to the truck. And then what happened after that? CC first. She didn't have a blanket. She had a blue blanket. 
I think you like it. So was she alive when she went into the oil tank? No? I put the blanket over her head. And that's how she passed. Good breathe. I put the blanket over her head. I didn't want to. No. I strangled her right there in the back seat. Okay. What was Bella doing? She didn't have her. Did she understand? Did she know what was going on? She didn't say anything. And then the same for Bella? Just without a blanket? With the blanket. Oh, okay. I didn't look. Like every time I closed my eyes, I just to hear her say, Daddy, no, and that was it. That's what Bella said. I hear that every day. Do you hear that? But once the girls were, were gone, um, was it also just a minute by minute thing as far as the oil tanks? Yeah, I didn't know what, what to do. I mean, I, just thinking about an oil tank it just makes me more swung throw up. Mm. And was that just because it was in front of you and there it was and it just presented itself? It wasn't a, a plan beforehand? Okay. Was there any reason why the separate ones? No, it's, it's like you said, it was like a going up, going up the stairs and it didn't, no, like what Frank said, it's like I was trying to separate everybody. That's not, no, no yeah. I didn't want to separate anybody. What was the reason? I, I, I can't even tell you. It's like, like I said, like something else was a control of what I was doing. And it was like, I was doing something I never thought I would ever do in my life. Mm -hmm. Did you think there would be less chance of someone finding them if they were in separate tanks or? I don't know. Sounds like a little. Oh. Mm -hmm. nah, I, I didn't. I, whatever, whatever my reasoning was in my head that day, it was slurping sound. You know, nothing was right. And you don't even remember thinking about it? No, it was just like, it was like, like a reaction of something that I wasn't even thinking about. Can you talk about the trash bags? Do you remember that? Oh, uh, with, uh... There were two. Oh, uh, with, okay. Yeah, I was trying to, because, like, the sheet kept... I didn't want to, like, when, when I was putting this one coherent, I guess, the thing I had, like, I didn't want the girls looking at Shanann while they were in the back seat. Mm. So what'd you do? I put a trash bag on the one end and on her feet and on her head so they didn't have to see. Mm. Okay. And they were just too little to kind of figure out, right? Yeah, they didn't have to see. Okay. That's good. I just know, like, when I was driving up there, I mean, you know, they were just, you know, sitting there just, you know, kind of asleep or kind of just, like, you know, holding on to each other, laying in each other's laps. You know, I, I didn't. Do you remember having any thoughts or thinking about why not just putting them all together with Shanann? Honestly, honest, it was just happening so fast. I had no I, time to really have a thought that was my own. Okay. It wasn't happening fast. Chris would continue to try and distance himself from his own actions because they are beyond horrific. I tried to edit the confession to be as concise as possible, but the full unedited version is linked below. Again, we will go over that confession at a later date, as the tactics used by the interviewers are fantastically interesting. But for now, if you want to hear that in full, you may. To summarize, Shanann came back from her work trip at 2 a.m. that morning, climbed into bed with Chris, and the two were intimate for the first time since she had become pregnant with Nico. As we know from her texts, she believed a lot of their issues could be resolved if they were to be physically intimate, and she suspected that he might be seeing someone else based on his reluctance to get physical with her. 
He then got up hours later, got ready for work, and woke her up in order to tell her that he no longer loved her or wanted to be with her, though he contends that he didn't foresee this conversation turning into her brutal murder. He sat on top of her stomach and chest the entire time, essentially pinning her down so she would be unable to leave. When asked why he would do this, he responded that he might have already planned to kill her subconsciously, although he wasn't really sure, because apparently you can subconsciously plan a murder. After telling her that he no longer loved her, she told him he would never see their children again. He contended that this statement incensed him to the point where he flew into a rage and strangled her to death. Shortly thereafter, Bella woke up, heard the struggle, walked into her parents' bedroom, and saw her mom's dead body, with her father looming over it. That night, she had gotten up multiple times to see if Shanann was home. In that final time, she would see her mother murdered. She asked him what was wrong with Shanann, and Chris said she was just sick and proceeded to drag her body, not carry or move her with any care, through the home to the garage. This would include dragging her body down the staircase of the home, which was so loud it woke Cece up. Chris loaded the girls, along with their mother's corpse, into the back of his work truck, and set off to one of his work sites. For 45 minutes, the girls sat in the back of the vehicle with their mother's dead body, which Chris had covered in a large garbage bag. Asking what their dad was doing with their mom, he assured them repeatedly that they were going to get her help. But of course, that never happened. Instead, after getting to one of his work sites, he covered three-year-old Celeste's head with her favorite blanket and strangled her to death in front of Bella. The four-year-old had no idea what exactly was happening, but according to Chris, she knew it was bad. After he was sure that he had murdered his youngest daughter, Chris took Celeste's body out of the car and carried her corpse to one of the site's oil wells, where he forcibly stuffed her into it, hoping that the oil would destroy her remains. He then returned to the car and did the same to Bella, making sure to keep Celeste's blanket with him so he wouldn't have to look at his daughter's face while he murdered her. My daddy is a hero. He helps me grow up strong. He helped me um, not go to. He reads me books. He ties my shoes. You're a hero, blue and blue. My daddy, daddy, I love you. Oh, I love you. She was the only one to fight back, understanding that whatever her father was doing was bad, and he had hurt her baby sister and mother. Her last words were, Daddy, no, and as her father overpowered her, she bit her tongue. When he had successfully smothered the four-year-old, being the big strong man that he was, Chris then brought her body to a separate oil tank and forced her into it. The holes on top of these tanks were small. The amount of force required to push his daughter's body into it was immense, but he managed to. He then headed back down to where his car was parked and dug a shallow grave for his wife. The way he tells it, he killed Shanann because he was trying to keep the children away from him, and then spent the next two hours so blinded by his rage that he killed his own offspring that he wanted to keep in his life. While this version of the story is certainly more honest than the one he would go on to tell after his polygraph interview, it's still peppered with details that are meant to both justify his actions against Shanann and try to skew the listener to view him as a victim in these circumstances, which to be clear is not the case. Shanann was not a perfect person. No one is. There is no such thing as a perfect victim, and there is plenty of content online where Shanann snaps at people and comes across as rude and high-strung, but neither she nor her daughters deserved to have their lives ended. So now, let's listen to Chris' attempt to spin those facts into a story where, as always, it's not his fault but Shanann's. Part of it, didn't I? Yeah. So I brought Graham in here because we okay. want to talk to you about the results, okay? Sure. So, um, it is completely clear that you were not honest during the testing, and I think you already know that. Um, he did not pass the polygraph test. Okay. Okay. So now we need to talk about what actually happened. And I feel like you're probably ready to do that. In our last video, we went over how polygraph exams work and why they are not admissible in court. These tests are not reliable and the results can be manipulated easily. Just because Chris, 
catastrophically failed the test, that doesn't inherently mean that he hurt his wife and kids. If Chris had spoken to a lawyer, they would have no doubt informed him of this. They could easily argue that Chris is emotionally distressed, and is mere days out from his wife and children going missing, hence his failure. But he hasn't spoken to a lawyer. In fact, Chris was so scared of appearing guilty after murdering his entire family that he would purposely forego getting any legal advice. That same fear is why he is still willing to sit in this interrogation room after five hours. He is still free to go. They are not forcing him to talk to them. And yet he stays. I didn't, I didn't lie to you on that polygraph, I promise. Chris, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no. going to stop. It's time. I, just I'm, stop for a minute. Take a deep breath. I, I want you to take a deep breath right now. There's a reason you feel sick to your stomach. And when people hold stuff inside, it makes you physically ill. And I can just tell on your face, I can tell you tell from the second you walked in that you were wanting to just come clean and just be done with this. And I appreciate that because you knew sitting down in that chair that you weren't going to pass today. And you knew I was going to find out because I told you that. And then you continued to stay knowing that you could at the end say, you know what? I just need to get this off my chest. Like, I just need to tell you what happened. We're not, we're not here to play games. We're not here to do any of that with you. We just want to know what happened. So can you start from the beginning and tell us what happened? If you're wondering why this interaction feels so strange, it's for one very clear reason. Chris is being confronted about lying to law enforcement. They are outright telling him that they know that he had something to do with it. Yet at the same time, they are encouraging him to breathe through his anxiety, stating that they do not hold his deception against him and that they think he's probably a good person. These two things are directly at odds with one another. Implicitly, if you think a person is capable of murdering their entire family, including two innocent children under the age of five, you cannot believe they are also a good ethical and moral person. But the interviewers are able to effectively sell that viewpoint in an earnest way. Many people who have watched this interrogation uncritically have condemned these two stating that they were way too nice and forgiving towards the family annihilator. But that isn't the case. They are straddling the line between assuring Chris that they understand where he's coming from with the murders, and putting pressure on him subtly, in order to garner a confession. Everything that I've, just, I've told you, I did not lie on this polygraph. I am, I don't know how much I could, I could tell you right now, like, I did not it's, it's, not I even, it's not even an option right now since you did not pass the polygraph, I so I know you were being deceptive. So that's not even an issue, an issue right now. The issue right now is what happened to Shanann, Bella, and Celeste. That's the issue right now. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about that. Throughout every interview, every media appearance, and even the body cam footage, Chris has come across incredibly uncaring about this entire ordeal. It's only now when he's being confronted with the fact that he is a terrible liar and the investigators are telling him directly that they know he was involved, that he begins to show any emotion. He's stuttering, unable to properly defend himself in any reasonable way. This shows that the vast majority of his stress and anxiety in this scenario is centered on his own well-being. He wasn't emotional about hiding the body of his wife in a shallow grave or dumping his children's bodies into oil wells, as he was able to go right into work after as if nothing was wrong. He had no issues talking to police hours later, telling them that he had no idea where his wife or children were, or where she would have taken the kids. It's only when he is directly put on the spot, when his own life is put in peril, that he becomes alarmed. I know, I know you want to tell us. I, I, can, I can see it in your face. Holding this lie in is going to do nothing for you. I, I know this. Like, okay. I'm not, like trying to like cover things up like yeah but you kind of are because in in it's normal normal people would do that normal people that make a mistake initially are going to go i don't know what you're talking about i didn't do anything that's normal i would expect that it's just like if you ask your kid you know did you write on the wall and they go no and you're like I, you have a marker on your hand like i know you just wrote on the wall and they're like oh okay that's a natural reaction that someone's going to initially lie about something like that and then eventually tell the truth. So this is your eventually telling the truth time. This is where this is where the rubber meets the road, Chris. Like, don't let this continue any longer, please. 
I, I'm not trying to make anything continue. Like, I want them back home, like. But you know they're not coming back home. You know I, that. I don't know in the back of my head. I'm, I hope they come back home. But you know they're not. Uh, I hope they come back home. Mm -hmm. And I don't know they're not coming back home. Chris, Timmy, and I are confused. Yeah. And here's what we're confused about. I told you that we've done some work overnight. Yeah. I told you that we've got a lot of leads. Okay, that wasn't a lie. Uh -huh. We know a lot more than we think we do. Okay. And here's where we're confused. You're this great guy. I'm not just telling you that, okay? I'm telling you that because everyone tells us that. Okay? We can't find anyone to say anything bad about you. Chris is a great guy. He's a good father. He's a good man. We're confused as to why you're not taking care of your beautiful children. I'm not taking care of them right now. Right now. Where are they? I don't know where they're at. I, honestly, I do not know where they are at. If I could have my babies back home right now, I would. I want them back. I want everybody back. That is the God's honest truth. Chris has just been directly told that the lead investigators believe that he murdered his wife and kids. Anytime he insisted that he is innocent and wouldn't have harmed them, they either rebut him entirely or tell him they know that that isn't true. Most people in his position would find this accusation insulting, especially if they really don't know what happened to their entire family. They might even break down emotionally trying to prove their innocence. But not Chris. He just sits there and takes it. He is still a free man. If he said he wanted to leave and not come back, he would be well within his rights, especially given that he has been there for over five hours already. Yet, he insists on staying. His need to appear like he cares about the investigation, as if he is innocent, is making him look guiltier. For nearly a full minute, they look at him silently. This uncomfortable silence is usually used to pull more information out of the suspect, but it's ineffective here. just can't figure out why there's two Chris's, okay? We talked about that last night. Yes. We just can't figure it out. There's a Chris, okay? If somebody asked me my kid's child routine, I would say, I don't know, go after them all. That's the truth, right? And so it is very surprising to me, and it warms my heart that you're the type of dad who can pack a bag in the morning. And you know just what to put in there. And you know just what to put in there as a backup in case they have an accident. Okay. You know what the clothes to put in there. You know what they have for breakfast. You know what they have for a snack and a dinner and a nighttime snack. You can tell me the book you read to your daughters. Okay. I know you love them. And you're not faking that, are you? That's real. Okay. There's a lot of guys who come in here and try to tell me that. And I know they're lying. Okay. Because they can't answer those questions that you can answer. Okay. But you are here today lying about something else. So we need to talk about that, okay? That's your daughter. I know. In the time that has elapsed since he was made aware that he failed the polygraph test, he believed he had thought of the ultimate get-out-of-jail-free card, that being his relationship with Nicole. He thought in this moment, if he were to come clean about the affair, he could make it appear that that was the real reason as to why he hadn't passed. Chris is not a good liar. 
It's been demonstrated to him over and over again that when he is lying to anyone besides his parents, he does a horrendous job, and yet he still does it. So the concept that he would be able to sell this more complex lie to law enforcement is ridiculous. Chris thought he had an ace in the hole, and that he would be able to distract from his obvious guilt by using Nicole, but if anything, it made him appear more guilty. Moreover, they already knew about the affair. The day prior, Chris had given them his cell phone, and they immediately found the fake calculator app that held all of her nearly naked photos. They had also been contacted by Chris and Nicole's employer that day with the emails that were shared between the two, and Nicole had come in for an in-person interview herself. Chris hadn't so much as deleted their text messages or emails, so why he thought the FBI wouldn't find out about Nicole, we do not know. When Chris threw out that he was having an affair, he believed that Tammy and Graham were going to react with shock. They were going to be surprised that a family man like Chris had strayed on his pregnant wife, and they would understand how he had failed the polygraph. But instead, Graham promptly shut that down, effectively destroying Chris with minimal effort. And she's very good. I, 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 I'm not sure I don't think anything like that could happen. I don't think I would ever do it, but I did. I know. Keep going. She accused me of it. I denied it. I, I had she on her, and I feel horrible for it. Like, she was pregnant, and it was. I don't want it. I didn't hurt her. I cheated on her. I hurt her emotionally. I cheated on her. And I feel absolutely horrible about this, but that's what I've been holding. I think that when I, I didn't go to the Rockies game, I was with her. Okay. I went to dinner with her. Okay. Keep going. That five weeks I was alone, I was with her most, most of the time. Okay. You're doing a good job. This is the Chris that I knew would come out today. This is the Chris who tells the truth because you're a truth teller. When I tell you I fell out of love, it's because I fell in love with her. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, that's the truth. God's honest truth. Okay. Who is her? So I, I don't want to get her involved in this. I don't want to ruin her life. Like it's some, something like this. I don't want her involved in this. Once again, Chris displays just how stupid he really is. Somehow, despite being nearly six hours into an interrogation into his family's murder, which he committed mere days ago, he believes that he has the authority to tell the police that he doesn't want his mistress to be involved in the murder investigation, and therefore is not going to name her. He also seems completely unaware that they already know who she is, even though they stated that seconds earlier. Despite knowing that, he thinks that Nicole will never come forward on her own, and that the FBI agents will be unable to find any identifying information about her. So can we talk about that a little bit? Yes. I knew that you would say you didn't want to get her involved. Well, I, I, just, I, I, you like she's, she's, her. she's a wonderful person. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, she knew I was married, yes. And I told her we were going through issues. Yes. yes. And I told her that, you know, we were going to get, you know, at the end, like, we are going to get separated. Like, once I figured out what that was, I didn't know what that was going to be. I know. I had no idea. I, I like, you know, I saw her, took my breath away, and I never thought in a million years that could happen. I know. I don't even think of my favorite. But, um, like, but, like, it was, I never felt that way about anybody, like, Anybody in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Chris, that's not your fault. No, I'm, I'm, I, I, no, 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 I'm just. Okay. I'm, can we do this? Um, I know you want to take care of her because it's because you're a type of guy that takes care of women. It is. You took care of your wife, you took care of your daughters, you were very good at taking mm -hmm. care of her, and you want to take care of her. So, can we make a deal? I don't think this girl. Did anything to hurt anybody, but I can't walk out of here wondering. So, can you leave her out of it? Okay. Can you get back to your wife and your daughters. Okay. Where are they? I have mentioned this throughout the interviews, but both Graham and Tammy are skilled at what they do. They know Nicole's name and a significant amount of information about her. But instead of pulling the rug out from under Chris at this precise moment, they allow him to continue to believe he has any power or authority in this situation. 
they refer to Nicole as the girl. They say they are okay with leaving her out of it, and they bring the line of questioning back to Shanann and the girls, which Chris inappropriately reacts to with relief. He prefers talking about, or rather, lying about murdering his family than talking about his mistress. Before we go on, Graham and Tammy have already started using the read technique in this interview, which we have covered in our third video in the series. As a reminder, the steps are as follows. Number one, direct confrontation. Number two, try to shift the blame away from the suspect to some other person or set of circumstances that prompted the suspect to commit the crime. Number three, reinforce sincerity to ensure the suspect is receptive. Number four, move the theme of the discussion toward offering alternatives by posing an alternative question, giving two choices for what happened, one more socially acceptable than the other. The suspect is expected to choose the easier option, but whichever alternative the suspect chooses, guilt is admitted. We've already experienced the direct confrontation phase, with the interrogators telling Chris that they know that he is guilty, but they will now be setting the stage for step two. In essence, this portion of the interrogation will feature both Graham and Tammy telling Chris that Shanann was a horrible, controlling person, that he was such a wonderful husband and father, dedicated to them and only them, that they don't blame him for wanting to murder Shanann. This by no means is what either party thinks or believes, and we've seen countless discussions that point to this portion of the interrogation as being inappropriate and disrespectful towards Shanann's memory, as well as being indicative of how people saw the mother. But to be clear, even if Shanann was as awful as they indicate, neither her daughters nor her deserved to be killed. I do not know. That was what I was holding back. Like, I didn't know, like, what I did. I know, Chris, in the interview today, you weren't asked about infidelity. You were asked about... That was... I was holding back from last night. That's when you what talk, you feel today. That's not how that works. You would have reactions to every single question, not just the ones that we talked about being important. Like the ones you wanted me to lie about, I, like, is that what you're talking about? No, the ones about her disappearance mm -hmm. and knowing where she's at and about what you... about seeing her last. I was not lying about those things. So, can, I, can I tell you what I think? Yes. Okay. So, going into that interview today with Tammy, where we strapped you in, we knew, we knew all about Nikki. Okay? All about her. And you're doing a very good job right now, because you didn't have to tell us about her, but you did. I, I couldn't hold that in anyone. I know. We, I, could, we could see it in your chest, I can. in your eyes. Okay? Here's the challenge that we have. We knew about Nikki, and so we didn't need to ask you about her in the polygraph. We just didn't need to, because we knew, okay? And so that's why we didn't ask you, because we already knew the answer, okay? We're very, very worried about your daughters and your wife. I am too, okay? So can I tell you maybe, um, based on the people that I've talked to, and Tammy's talked to, based on all the investigations that we've done, based on your cell phone, both your cell phones, your wife's cell phone, Nikki's cell phone, okay, based on talking with family members and friends and based on talking with everyone. Here's what we know, okay, and I'm not going to lie to you right now, here's what we know, okay. Chris is a good man. Everyone said it, okay. I'm not just telling you that because I, you know, want to blow smoke here. You're a good man, okay. Nobody can fake answers about packing a backpack, nobody. You either pack a backpack for your kids or you don't, okay. This should have been the happiest time of your marriage. Okay? You and Shanann. This should have been the happiest time. She's making a little money. She's making good money. You're making great money. You both have a job. You have beautiful kids. You have a beautiful house. You're in Colorado. Clean air. Good people. Okay? And on top of that, you look pretty good now. You're pretty fit. Okay? This should have been a time in your marriage where you guys were happy and thriving and productive. Okay? And I believe... That Shanann's the reason none of that happened. I believe that she's a controlling person. Maybe doesn't listen to you as much as she should. I think that she can do whatever she wants and you can't. Okay? I think if you were to go to a restaurant, she would order whatever the hell she wants. And as soon as you order a nice steak, she says, whoa, buddy. Okay? A woman that lets her man do all of the backpack packing and all of the cooking 
I do all the cooking, but yeah. she cooks like I yeah. do like some things here and there. Okay. That's because you're a good person, and I think that she started on the path to leave the marriage. Okay. It's ironic that we're talking about you and Nikki. I think that she was the one who started on that path first. What do you think about that? I wouldn't have thought about that. Okay. The other thing I think is interesting is, even though she is that type of person that's controlling, doesn't listen, does what she wants, is walking away from her kids, here you are defending her. Because to your core, you want to take care of the people you love. And that's the reason why we want to give you an opportunity today to just help us find them. The phraseology here is important as it lays the blame for the girl's disappearance and probable murder directly at Shanann's feet rather than his own. This is the version of events that Chris has been trying to put forward the entire time. He spent the previous two days telling anyone who would listen that Shanann likely took the girls on her own and is out somewhere, maybe with a friend, but no one took the bait. So hearing some form of this story would be incredibly relieving for him. However, it also implies that Shanann is only responsible for what happened to the girls, and then Chris was responsible for what happened to her. To be plain, they are laying the groundwork for Chris to state that he murdered Shanann after she killed the girls as revenge. But that is clearly ridiculous. If your wife kills your children, you don't dispose of their bodies at your work site then call their school and daycare to disenroll them in order to save money. Even so, Chris's mother would believe that version of events well after he confessed to what actually happened, with him going so far as to say in his full confession that he thought he could get away with that version of events, strictly because his mother and sister hated Shanann so much that they would believe anything negative said about her. Okay. Will you do that for us? I'll do whatever I can to help the Find them where they're at. Okay. So when she asked you, do you know where they are, or are you going to tell the truth about where they are, you failed miserably. Okay. Why? I'm, I'm a nervous person. Like every question I asked, every question that felt like I did, I wouldn't even say the right thing. That's not how the polygraph works. I don't and like. I don't know like what it reads like. Through, I know what she was saying about the autonomy of of the process, but like, I don't know where they're at. Chris, right now your dad's outside. He flew across the country to help him. Okay. You're lying to him. You lied to everyone you talked to. And they all bought it. Please help us find your babies. I want to find them. I've told you over and over. I want to find everyone. Can we go back to that night? Yeah. You know that we have texts. And we know that there's an Alexa in your house. Mm -hmm. And you know that those are trained to record distress. Okay. You know that we know the content of Nikki's text messages and your text messages and Shanann's text messages. Okay. I didn't know you knew where Nikki was until tonight, right now. So. Okay. One of the biggest hindrances when it comes to observing Chris is deciphering whether or not he's an idiot or if he just has an insanely oversized ego. But potentially it's both. The interviewers both independently stated that they knew he was having an affair, that they had spoken with Nicole, and that they knew more about his relationship than Chris thought that they did. But when he is told that they were able to see Nicole's messages with Chris, he says he didn't know they had access to that. We mentioned this earlier, but Chris hadn't deleted any of his texts with her. Yet, he's surprised that they were able to find them when he gave his phone to them the night prior. He gave them evidence willingly, and then is shocked that they found the things he didn't hide. He also seemed to be operating under the delusion that he could keep Nicole out of this, that she would not willingly talk to the police, and that their relationship would only be a blip on their radar. Sure, I was having an affair when my wife and kids disappeared, but law enforcement wouldn't possibly want to talk to the woman I would have killed my family for. Maybe he thought that if Nicole came forward about the affair, she would refuse to allow them to access her phone. 
or would have gotten rid of it entirely and then lied on his behalf, but obviously that wasn't the case. Tell us about that night again, and please tell the truth. This time. I, I told you the truth. I, um, I promise I've told you the truth. Like, I woke up at 4 o'clock. I woke up at 4 o'clock. Got dressed, got ready. 4.15, and she didn't talk. About the house, about the separation. Did you guys talk about Nikki? She, she accused me of like, all right, well, you know, is there somebody else? Sure. I didn't say it. You denied it? Yeah. Okay. Because she brought up like, you know, like, well, was there a sixty dollars charge at um, dinner the other night? Okay. Was that two of you? And then was with two of you, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. That's me. Okay. So it sounds like. At that time, there was maybe you weren't quite ready to just say, "Say I this, this I got everything." I couldn't, I couldn't say it. Okay. Pausing once more, but Chris didn't even try to hide his cheating on Shanann towards the end. When he was on a date with Nicole, he would use their shared credit card, which Shanann was vigilant about checking. But he thought he was an incredibly gifted liar, so I'm sure she believed him when he said there was no one else. We were already trying hard enough. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't say that. Okay. What did you say? I just told her, like, oh, this separation has to go. I want separation. Okay. Was there a idea to sell the house of yours? She initiated the realtor the week before an email. Why? Because we were talking about we, the marital issues. She's like, well, we can't live, afford to live on our own. Well, she can't afford to live on her own. I can't afford to live on So she was like, we need to. Just contact Van. You can see. And who did you contact? Well, she contacted Ann, our realtor. Ann? Yeah. Okay. Would Ann say the same thing that your wife con- initiated the contact? Yeah. Okay. She would. And then on Monday, I was I texted her to see if she could, what she could do. Okay. And that's in there too. You fired your head. Tell me about the pregnancy. Is that your idea or hers? She said it was about, she was about 80-20. Well, I was about, I went to the pros and cons of it. Like after she got, after she got pregnant, she told everybody that it was mainly my idea. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, it was, I, I wanted a boy. Did you want to get pregnant? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then after the fact, she said it was mainly me that wanted it. And she was about, you know, she was like 70, 30 against it at that point. Like she would tell her friends that. Yeah. And I was just like, what, 70, 30 against it? Like, why? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's unclear if he is saying she had not wanted to get pregnant before he started emotionally pulling away from her and pursuing Nicole, or if it was after, but him asking why is ignorant. We don't even know Shanann, but we've watched all the content she made while researching these videos, and pregnancy was not easy on her. She was chronically ill, dealing with fibromyalgia and lupus. A quick Google search of either of those illnesses and pregnancy provides thousands of medical sites that talk about how hard pregnancies can be on women who deal with either of those ailments, let alone both. She also already had her hands full with Bella and Celeste, not to mention the family's money issues. Her not wanting to bring another kid into the world, knowing the stress it would put on them, as well as the stress it would put on her body, is not a sign of her selfishness. Again, it's apparent that after Chris began his affair, nearly all of the information he had learned about his wife of almost a decade ceased to be important to him. Can you understand that some of this just doesn't make sense to us? How is it possible that a woman and two kids are just completely gone off the face of the earth? I promise you, I have, I have nothing on my hands that's, I did nothing to those kids or her to make them vanish. So tell me what happened then. I believe you that you did nothing on your hands. What happened? When I left, I mean, it's on video that I left and no, I was in my truck. I didn't like load anything into my truck besides my tools, my container, my book bag, my water jug, my lunchbox. Okay. But then what happened? I didn't load anything into my truck, except for the things I loaded into my truck, but I swear it wasn't the dead body of my wife and my two innocent children, who had spent the last 45 minutes of their lives 
huddled next to her body. This isn't a good argument. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I drove out of the driveway. No, before you drove out of the driveway. What happened with your wife and your kids? I didn't do anything like that. They were still in the house. Where are they? Where did they go? I don't know, sir. I really don't know. Your wife's not the type of person to vanish. I know she's not. She had 10 things on her schedule that meant she was going to be there the next day, that day, the yeah. day after that, with friends, with a doctor. Okay? She didn't leave because she wanted to. Okay. So what happened? To her or the kids. Was it an accident? I didn't do anything. Was it an accident? There was, there was no accident. I don't know if there was an accident in the house. I wasn't there for it. It's a big deal if it's an accident because we can work with that, Chris. No. And yeah, I there's think no, that's maybe what happened. There's no, I did not cause an accident. I didn't do anything to my wife and kids. Was it a misunderstanding? There's no misunderstanding. Like, we had that talk. There was no such thing where I, I didn't tell her about the affair. Okay. I didn't. That, okay. that was a misunderstanding. Like, sure. Miscommunication. Yeah, misunderstanding. Yeah. Good. But I probably should have told her right then. Honestly. I mean, everything was out on the table anyways. Right. I should have just told her right then. But I didn't because I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. What was your plan? What were you going to do? I mean, how was the separation going to work? Like, once we got separated, I would get my own place, and then we, I mean, 50 50 split with the kids, that's what I was hoping. Mm -hmm. What about Nikki? Take it slow and just see if, you know, if anything develops, like, when I'm, you know, at my own place. I just, I just find it hard to hear you talk about having this emotional, you know, conversation with Shanann and you're bawling and crying together and you have not shed one tear in two days that you've been here. No, not one. Prepare yourself. Chris will be attempting his greatest performance yet. And I, help me understand that because I don't get it. You're, these are your baby girls oh. and you have not shed one tear over them not being around. Chris, I, 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 I lose my four-year-old in the store for 10 seconds and I start to go panic. Panic. I have not seen any of that from you. At all. Help me understand I, that. I love those girls. I, I would never do any of this because I haven't shed a tear. You yeah, realize. no, that's weird. I, Is I, that I, weird? I, I, don't, don't. Look into that like, I don't love my well, kids, I love me. my Explain wife. To me. You're don't look into that is potentially the greatest sentence ever uttered in any interrogation room. Chris doesn't seem to realize that it's their job to look into that, and that for the past couple of days, all they have been doing is looking into that. Mind you, if you are ever talking to someone and you mention how they don't often show you a certain emotion, and then they immediately show you that emotion in a very obvious way, they're lying to you. Chris audibly tries to make himself cry, sniffling and causing his voice to break as if he is in a community theater production. He has had ample opportunity to show that he cares about his wife and kids, and he simply has not done so. The most care he has shown has always been self-serving. You're crying with your wife that you're leaving her. Yeah. But you don't cry that you're two little baby girls. I'm hoping they're there. still around somewhere. I'm hoping they're still somewhere. Yeah, but you don't have them right now. You're I not know. reading stories to them at night. I know. You're not giving them midnight snacks. You're not giving them their medicine. You're not waking up with them in the morning. I know this. Like I. So that I, should cause you it, pain. It does cause me pain. But I don't see that. I, I don't see that. I want to I, see the Chris that cares. I want to see I, the Chris that, you know, feels bad about what he did and wants to, you know, get this off his chest and be done with this and let us find your little girls so that they're not out there in the middle of a field or whatever somewhere. Like, don't do that. I, I love those girls to death. Then show us that. Show us that. Show us this Chris, that not this sense. Chris. I'm not... I'm not showing you that. I'm, I'm showing you the Chris that cares about his girl and his wife. Just because I haven't shed a tear, it shouldn't make you feel like I haven't, that the love isn't there for them. It's weird. 
it doesn't I'm, make I'm, sense. I understand you, that. You have to. I I, I, I totally see where you're coming from. Trust me, like there's nothing. I, just because Chris, I. Chris, you know, people can be pushed to the point where they do something that they regret. It happens I'm, every single day. I know. But so, part of what makes you a man is the guy that goes really fucked up. But this is what I did, and I'm going to pay for what I did, and I'm going to tell you what I did, and I'm going to be honest about it. Chris, we can keep talking to you once we find these girls, okay? So once we find these girls and your wife, right, no matter how we find them, no matter what condition they're in, we can keep talking to you, and you can tell us, guys, it's not as bad as it looks. And you can say, let me tell you what happened. I was never comfortable with you, Graham, or with you, Tam. No, I wasn't comfortable yet. But now that everything's known, now that these girls are found and Shanann's found, however they're found, it's okay. We can keep talking to you. Okay. Chris, did Shanann do something to them? No, I don't know. I'm serious. I, I have no clue. No, you would have known. They didn't leave the house. Did Shanann do something to them, and then did you feel like you had to do something to Shanann? They were at the house when I left. They were there. They weren't there. They didn't leave. They vanished. You were the only way they could have left is in your truck. There's no way, because like I didn't just throw them in, in my truck. That they, that you know your truck is GPS. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Because you told your boss, like, yeah. hey, I'm going to celebration, maybe staying yeah. at a friend's house, whatever. You know that thing pings every ten seconds? Yep. Yeah. So we will know. Exactly. I know. Where you went. And your company's giving that to us. I know. Okay. Are we not asking the right questions, Chris? You're asking all the questions. All the questions. What are we not asking you right? What What are we doing wrong? We're not doing anything wrong. Did Shanann do something? She did anything to these kids. We both love them with all our hearts. There's no way. It could have been an accident. Something happened in the house that you know about. You failed the polygraph test, right? This is not about did you leave and your wife vanished and you didn't know anything about it. That was not what you were asked, okay? Okay. We know that something happened to all three of them. But I want to know did something happen to these baby girls first that you had to take into your own hands and deal with? You had to clean it up for us, Chris, you gotta tell us. There's something that happened to these baby girls. Look at them. I know. Before he came in, I was watching videos. The way Chris says this is still completely emotionally unaffected. While it's possible Chris watched those videos out of sincere remorse for what he had done to Bella and Celeste, it is possible that he, knowing that he was being filmed, purposely pulled those videos up in order to make himself appear innocent and like a father in mourning. This lone action stands out amongst the rest and rings incredibly false. We have no doubt you love these girls with all of your heart. I have no doubt. But we make mistakes. That's okay. It's what we do with those mistakes that make us who we are. Chris, it seems like you're thinking about it right now. What are you thinking about? She could have. I feel like you cleaned up for her. I feel like that's the type of guy that you are. Which one of these has the breathing thing? Well, they both have inhalers, but she, she has the EOE. The encephalitis of the drivers. Did she have problems breathing? And probably like, well, what? Her allergies and whatnot, like if she had anything next, but she just had two of the endoscopies and everything, the surgeries I told you about. Do you think she had trouble breathing that night? And she freaked out? And didn't want to live without 
Oh, baby girl. Did you hear about the homicide that happened in Aurora? Where the guy beat that family to death with a ball peen hammer? The only person that survived was a three year old sibling. And that sibling grew up to be a total mess. No family, no mom and dad, no brother or sister. She just sort of by herself. She says, I wish I would have died with them. And there are times that people freak out. I've seen it. I mean, I've been in law enforcement for almost 20 years. I've seen it. Parents freak out and they're like, oh my God, like, I can't have my baby girls live without each other. They're best friends. They're like twins. They're, you know, they wake each other up in the morning. And I understand wow. that. We had a mom in Castle Rock that suffocated both her baby girls. She's like, I just, my husband was going to take them. And she's like, I just couldn't, just couldn't handle I thought I was doing right by them. I thought I was saving them pain. And I get it. Why? Why was she saving them pain? Because she didn't want them to have to live without their mom. Chris, has a weight that's going to be on you for the rest of your life until we resolve it tonight. Unless we can talk about this more tonight, we're going to follow you forever. I promise you, when you start talking to us, you will feel better. I know you already feel better about getting the Nikki off your chest. Please don't. Please don't invite, involve her in the news or anything like that. She can't do that. you got to help me. I know. Chris, we're giving you a lifeline right now. You need to take it. You need to reach out and take it. Did they look like this tonight, the last night you were with them? She had that dress on, like, on the 8th or 9th. It wasn't this, but she had that dress on. I remember I had the two buttons on the back. I'd take them off so I'd get her down on that night. Did you guys make sure that they were warm when you left the house? Make sure they were warm? They're, they're always warm. They're, they always have, when they're in their beds, they're always warm. Okay. Are you guys taking care of them at the very end? Or they're, always, they're, they're always taken care of. They're always, they never miss a meal. Chris, you took them out of the house with their blankets and their animals. That's because you cared. That's what a caring dad does. I mean, I'm always caring for these kids. There's no, nothing in this, in this world, or my life. I believe that. I believe that, and I believe someone made a mistake, whether it was you, you or Shanann. And you either cleaned up after Shanann or you made the mistake and I mean I want to believe that maybe Shanann did it and you felt compelled to fix this so Shanann didn't look bad. That's what I that's what I want to believe. But I don't know, you're not telling me that, so it makes me think the worst. Like, did you I did not do all three of them? Like what did she need to do? Tell us, Chris. Chicks are crazy. Can I have talk to my dad or something? Absolutely. Do you want to bring him in here? No, uh, I just can't talk to my dad. Like, I flew across the country. He crashed in. How about this? This is the first time that Chris has indicated that he's wanted to leave since he arrived at the police station nearly six hours prior. He's been free to leave the entire time, but he has stayed, hoping that that alone will make him appear innocent in the eyes of the investigation. Even now, he still doesn't go so far as to ask to leave, only to see his father. 
it's once again dawning on him that he is likely not going to get away with the murders. He becomes properly emotional because he knows that he will likely be going to prison. He has just had a barrage of information thrown at him. They know that Shanann and the girls could have only left the home in his truck. They know that they are dead and that they have the tracking information on his truck and on his phone. The jig is most certainly up, but he needs time. Time to decide how to proceed. Based on Tammy and Graham's priming, he already knows the socially acceptable way to admit to the murders. That being placing the blame for Bella and Celeste's murders squarely on Shanann's shoulders, then claiming that he killed her in a rage. This, of course, goes against all the direct evidence at the scene, but it will be used as a doorway into the truth of the situation. Getting Chris to admit at all that he killed anyone is massive. If we brought your dad in here, would you please tell him what happened? I just go talk to him. I've been in here for like five hours and I'm like, absolutely. Chris, look at me, man. It's not going to feel any better. He deserves an answer. He's your best friend. There's only one person you wanted here most, and it's your dad. Yes. What would you tell him? I, I love him, and I don't. I just, I just want him to be by my side. Okay. He knows more than we do that you're a good man. And he knows as much as you want to protect your wife, Shannon. I think he would tell you to do the right thing. Before we get him, can I go out there and talk to him? Well, I don't know that you want to do it out there because there's a lot of people going through the halls. Should we bring him in here? We'll step out. Okay. Do you need a few minutes with him? Okay. okay. Can we just ask a couple more questions? Again, Chris can say no. He can get up right then and leave. And they are very careful to never tell him he can't. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't want to do anything that makes him look guilty in their eyes. So instead, he sits and stays, despite all of his survival instincts telling him otherwise. It seems like you're about to get her off your chest. Is there any way that you can help us understand more about Shanann and why maybe something happened? so that we don't get a bad picture about her. What I mean is, what happened that night with her? As far as I after I talked to her? With the girls. Like when we were having that conversation in bed there? Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I talked to her about the separation and the house, and she asked me about the affair, and, okay. and that's that's how that conversation went. Okay. And God, she was distraught. She she had like mascara around her face, all that. I mean, it was it was emotional. Well, how about this? If we bring in your dad, would you promise me that you'll talk to him? I'll talk to him. Okay. Will you promise me that you'll tell him everything? Would it be easier if you told him and he told us? I don't know. Okay. I don't know if that's going to be easier or not. I tend to think it's not. I think you're the type of guy that needs to take responsibility because you always have taken responsibility. You've always made the right choice. So I guess I'm just worried that if we bring your dad in here, I could distract you. What do you think? Distract me from like talking to you? Yeah. I, I, just, I just need to talk to him. Okay. All right. I know you'll do the right thing. I do. I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, I think that you need to think a little bit more about that. Okay. And you need to realize that your dad is not going to stop loving you no matter what you tell him. You are his child. And he will not stop loving you. Never. Ever. And this is not the last chapter in anyone's story. 
at all. Okay. He's been here the whole time. You know, he, he didn't want to leave you. Have you ever seen uh, sometimes when an animal's owner dies, they stick around forever? I think that's your dad. I didn't want to leave today, okay? So keep that in mind. He wants to hear it all. Chris, we're going to let you have uh, however much time you need, okay? Sure. You know, maybe it's in there? Uh, yeah. Yes. Before we go over Chris's conversation with his father, we should talk about Ronnie for a moment. According to Chris, his father was an incredibly passive man. His mother, Cindy, was very similar to Shanann, in that she ran the roost, so to speak. Ronnie was so passive, in fact, that he often ignored and looked over conflicts. Chris would later state that when his father came down during the investigation, he didn't even ask Chris what had happened to the girls or the investigation at all. Instead, he chose to talk to him about a recent sporting event. Chris's wife and kids were missing, and Ron ignored it entirely. That is the kind of family that Chris was raised in, the kind where conflicts were avoided and he was almost always believed. Chris tells his dad that he failed the polygraph, and before he even has time to give Ron a reason as to why he didn't pass, he interjects, stating that he likely had too many emotions, which Chris has literally never been accused of. Even if you thought the world of your daughter or son, if the entire family was missing and they told you they had failed the polygraph test, it would be natural for you to react poorly, to be shocked, to sit up, move away from them a bit, or even ask if they were involved. But Ron is immensely calm, making excuses for Chris's actions at the drop of a hat. So I mean, they're not gonna let me go. Any reason why they shouldn't? What's another thing? They know I had an affair. They, they, they know. I can't think about that. They know you had an affair. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to tell me? What's, what's going on? Or what happened? Or anything? You know anything? Mm -hmm. We had that conversation that morning. It was, you know, it was emotional and it was total about separation and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Chris is beginning to go down the path that Tammy and Graham had laid out for him, the one where he blames Shanann for their daughter's murders, and states he lied for the past two days because he's just so noble. The issue that he's running into, though, is the fact that being subtle with his father doesn't work. His father has not been in the room for the entire interrogation. He has virtually no context for what Chris is saying. And so when Chris says that he's just trying to protect Shanann, even now, Ron needs clarification. She hurt him. Yeah. And, uh, 
It's obvious why Chris believed he was a master manipulator and a world-class liar, now that he is speaking with his father. The moment that he says Shanann hurt the kids, he is believed, even though, if they had paid attention to the investigation, that doesn't make sense. Shanann hurting the girls went directly against her character and the person that she had proven herself to be. In the months prior to the murder, she had been so concerned with her daughter's safety that she had taken them away from Cindy and Ron for not taking Cece's allergies seriously. But now, the moment Chris says she killed them, they simply believe him because they loathed her. Moreover, he questions virtually nothing about the validity of Chris's story. Chris says that she hurt the kids, and that he hurt her. Though not explicit, he is admitting to murder. But Ronnie doesn't notice. He doesn't react, or think that this is an admittance of guilt. Instead, he questions whether or not Shanann left after, even though that would be impossible. Again, Chris is believed outright, even though the details of his story don't make any sense. Had Ronnie been paying attention to the investigation, or had simply seen some of the news coverage, he would know that what Chris is saying doesn't align with the known facts of the case. But he doesn't question if his son is being honest with him. Chris's view of himself makes so much sense now. She freaked out all of the separation of them. I don't think it's, she laid like that out, but that's not the top stairs, but I heard like a little commotion upstairs, but I didn't think anything of it. Mm -hmm. And then you went back upstairs and she was there. I can see, see like she was on top of the stairs. I'm not joking like that.
in her heart, I know she knew about the affair. She's just waiting for me to say something, for me to deny it again. And she just lost it. That's not she went off and told her about. That's not the crying like happened. Rage. 
The second Ron states that they need to get him a lawyer. Tammy and Graham walk back into the room. Though Chris had just confessed to murder on tape and they have enough to hold him, they know he isn't being honest. Unlike Ron, they are not predisposed to believe his version of events, and they know that Shanann didn't hurt the girls. From this point on, the interrogation will mirror the first interview Chris did with Graham. They will go over his revised version of events in as much detail as Chris can muster. Then, like they had previously, they will tell Chris that they don't believe him and go over how the facts of the case do not match his story. Let's watch. Help us not do this with you, okay? Will you tell us what you told your dad? After that conversation. Water. Yeah. 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 After that conversation we had, and she accused me of the affair, I thought she, in her heart, she knew what was going on. And she knew about the dinner the other night. It was too much for just me. She knew all of them. That when I told her I went to a Rocky game, oh. I went out to bed. Mm -hmm. I went downstairs. And that's when you told her about the separation. Well, I, I, that was when I was upstairs in bed. Oh. And told her, you know. What I wanted in the call of the separation. And that's what I want. I'm downstairs and started packing up a few things. I heard a couple of things upstairs, but I didn't think anything of it.
after she was in her bed. the hard part. We have a lot of details for that. You have to get them out of the cold. Chris absolutely does not want to tell the police where his daughters are, because it undoes his entire story. He savagely killed his daughters, then forced their bodies into oil wells. The holes of the wells were too small for either girl to fit without hassle, so he forced them in, leaving their hair and skin on the outside of the hole. That is not the action of a man who loves his children. I know you came in today to do the right thing. 
He doesn't have to come in. He came in all in a row. Chris is really trying to sell his lies here, seemingly crying over how Shanann killed Bella and Celeste, but he has never managed to show care towards his daughters before this point, so it's unlikely that is really what he's crying over. Every time Chris has shown emotion thus far, it has been in reference to himself. He feels he's going to be found out. He panics and his voice begins to break. He realizes he isn't being believed and that everyone thinks he's guilty. He tries to appear a bit less apathetic. And now, when he knows he is at least going to be arrested for Shanann's murder and will be going to prison after this interview, he finally breaks down in tears. As much as he says that these emotions are about the brutal murders of his family, they are likely not. They are for himself. He is also buying time by his show of being overwhelmed with grief here, as he really cannot say what he did with his children's bodies. Saying that they are at the site he went to first that morning is one thing, as they could be anywhere. The interviewers each individually mention bringing them in from the cold, believing they are outside in the elements. But for Chris to detail how he disposed of their corpses is another thing entirely. Are they all three out there, Chris? Yes. What was she doing to CC? She's just on top of the roof. Back in the room. And then I went. And I was like, Did you saw it? I saw it on the monitor. Okay. And that's what I read in there. What'd she say? They were off. I saw CC was sorry, blue. It's not moving. And just that blind rage, I just did the same thing to her. Did you ever go into Bella's room? No. Just put Shannon back in. That's no. I saw her in the laundry. The way she was laying, the bed just sprawled out. when you packed up their special stuff. So where'd you put them? To get them out there? In the truck. In which part? In the truck center. In the passenger compartment? The truck center. In the truck. In the Don't you think they're on the way out there? There's... And the babies are gone. And uh, I put my hands around my wife's neck. I did that. Same thing. Did Shannon fight back at all? The rage that I had after seeing that, I, not much. How do you know she ran with that? Over. Yeah. 
for as passive as Ronnie has been this entire interview and how few details he knows about how Shanann and the girls actually disappeared, like every other member of the Watts family, he is able to recall details that he believes will make Shanann look responsible. This was Shanann's last Facebook post. It's a picture of a life-size doll that the girls had, with a blanket covering them completely. Chris has sent this photo to her while she was out of town, and she captioned it, I don't know how to feel. For this being her last Facebook post, there are many conspiracy theories as to what it meant, but based on the way she would post to Facebook, it was just a lighthearted joke about a weird thing her husband sent to her while she was out of town. But now that his son has accused his wife of killing their children, he's trying to spin this about how this post could have been foreshadowing. It is somehow proof that Shanann was capable of murder. If that's true, and he really believes that, then he would be horrified to learn that it was his son that sent her that photo. Again, this is likely why Chris thought he could get away with murdering his entire family and lying about it. If the two main authority figures in your life, your parents, believed your lies outright your entire life, you will start to think you can get away with anything. Chris's lies to his dad are not well thought out. They don't align with any of the evidence, and there are obviously holes in his story. Cindy Watts would go on to give interviews about Chris after his confession and stated that Chris was an amazing kid, that he never so much as lied or acted out while growing up. But every kid does. In the confession we went over at the top of the video, Chris would state that his parents never really questioned him or got on his case about most of the lies he told throughout his childhood. So he believed himself to be a master manipulator before he was arrested. I think it's point, I don't like him. That's this moment. That's a very good point. I can't say it now, but I'm blocked on the What did you say? What do you say to this? What kid would do that? I don't know, literally any child. Children baby their dolls and toys all the time. It's mimicking behavior, and most children attempt to parent their dolls in some way at that age to mirror their parents. It's incredibly common. Bella might have put a blanket over her doll's head. Trying to make a conspiracy theory about that post is just odd. There's a popular saying that goes, bitch eating crackers, which is to refer to when a person or a group hates an individual so much that entirely everything they do bothers them. So if they were upset seeing that person sitting, minding their own business, just eating crackers, they would still get upset and say, look at that bitch eating crackers. That is the same thing here. The Watts family hates Shanann. She is the reason why they didn't go to Chris's wedding. They refused to take part in the family events because they didn't like Shanann, and they often spoke about her as if she was an evil mastermind. Even before Chris had begun to accuse Shanann of anything, Cindy would state that she had taken the kids to punish Chris and repeat that story even after she knew the truth. Years of hatred had brought them to this point where a completely innocuous post was a sign of psychopathy and evil even though if the same post had been made on Chris's account, they would have viewed it as lighthearted fun. Do you remember that, Chris? What do you think? Just make fun of it. thought it was funny. Did Bella do it? I don't know. I don't remember. It sounds like a kind of uh, I'm sorry, I like you. I mean, you knew what was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You stayed for a reason. Chris, you're a good man. I'm not a good man. No. You stayed, you wanted to talk, you knew it was gonna be hard and you still stayed. That's what a good man does. Stay there for six hours and eleven minutes before. <laughs> I'm glad you did. I can see I'm a rage would come out and say I look for kids dead. You don't know. You don't know when you go 
个剧情，想到了。谢谢This is why you don't want a third party to sit in on an interrogation. Ronnie cuts in, obviously annoyed, at the repeated line of questioning going on. He would realize that Chris is not being believed, and, falsely thinking his son is being forthcoming and honest, in this phase of the interview, he steps in, essentially telling the detectives that Chris had already answered their questions and they should move on. He is also giving Chris a significant amount of assurance. He is parroting back Chris's story, rubbing his back and comforting him, which will significantly lessen the stress Chris is feeling. It will become their highest priority to remove Ron from the interview, although they would have to be extremely careful about doing so. He already told Chris they needed to talk to a lawyer, and if they outright tell him to leave, he might insist on ending the interview for Chris. Let's see how they proceed. They were not, in fact, going to help him get out of there. Again, Chris is attempting to avoid telling them where his daughters are, because as lenient as they have been throughout the interview, telling him that he actually was an amazing parent for packing the girls' lunches sometimes and cheating on his pregnant wife, there is no excuse for how he disposed of their bodies. Do you like what? Would you prefer them when you're one of your coworkers? Oh my god, no, no, no. Okay. I cannot. <laughs> Work for a company 
you and said that you're about to become a good man. They're going to say this. You're like, what the fuck did you do, Chris? Like, what? Like, why didn't you just go to college to begin with? Well, they weren't in your shoes. They don't know. I don't, they weren't living your life. I know, but still, it's like... People are going to like you never, like, like... That was the biggest emotional outburst that Chris has had throughout the entire investigation. And once more, it was self-serving. We can never know exactly what Chris is thinking, but throughout observing his behavior, it's clear that he only displays this level of care and emotionality towards himself. Hours after he killed and disposed of his entire family, he was at work as if nothing was wrong. When the police were looking for them in his home, he was next to them, passively texting, completely nonplussed. But now, when he thinks about what his co-workers are going to say about him, he is almost inconsolable. Looking like a good person, being regarded as moral and smart, that is more important to Chris than his entire family's life. We'll just go a little steps at a time. How about that? I can't, I can't have anybody show you out there, anybody, no co-workers, please. Okay. I mean, they're, they're just, they're just going to form their own opinions anyways once they figure everything out anyway. We'll just take little steps tonight then. How about that? Yeah. Do you have to have any of them with you? No. No. We can, prefer you. Can you and me and Tammy and Ronnie get in the car and just drive out there? Just point in general direction. You just point it? Chris, I know they're gone, but they're still your babies. And you're still their dad. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And you don't want someone else to find that out there. You don't, I promise you. Give us a second so we can kind of get some things arranged. Can you do that? Okay. Ronnie, do you want to stand in here with me? Graham and Tammy leave here to come up with a game plan on how to get Ron out of the room, as well as how to get more information out of Chris. He had already admitted to murder, but the fact that he was so cagey about where the bodies were indicated to them there was something more he was hiding. At most, they would believe he was hiding the bodies because they didn't align with his version of events. Maybe he had used a knife on Shanann. Maybe the girls hadn't been smothered. Regardless, they would have no idea how horrific his disposal process really was. But, since they knew the general location, they sent out search teams to try and recover the bodies anyways. Their main priority, when they returned, would be removing Ron out of the interrogation room without ending the interview altogether. He was directly hindering their interview. But if they were to simply say that he needed to leave so they could speak to Chris alone, he would advise Chris to talk to a lawyer and say nothing else.
I've always said she was a normal person, but I never thought in a million, million, million years that could happen. Even when he doesn't need to, Chris is throwing Shanann under the bus. This is likely how he spoke about her when she wasn't present, which is incredibly sad to think about. Shanann was always up front with her thoughts and feelings, to a fault. If she had an issue with someone, she had no problem telling them to their face. Meanwhile, whenever Chris wanted to get out of taking responsibility for his own actions, he would blame his wife. It was her fault he couldn't see his family, despite the fact that in their text messages he had cut them off himself years earlier, and he had agreed with her assessment of events. It was her fault that he was unhappy with his life, because she was so domineering, despite the fact that she hadn't wanted to get pregnant. She was the ultimate scapegoat for Chris, and even in her death at his hands, he blames her to a captive audience, dead set on believing anything he says. The next few moments will be extremely cathartic for Chris. He has spent the past couple days surrounded by people who do not trust him and tell him as much. So talking to a man who will take his frankly unbelievable story and simply believe it will be like a breath of fresh air. I'll be skipping about 30 minutes of their conversation, but as always, I'll leave a link to the original unedited footage so you can view it in its entirety. All you need to know is that Chris and his father continue to blame Shanann for everything that has happened, with Ronnie going so far as to say none of this was Chris's fault. My daughter, I went to my house before my wife found out. This ain't gonna be on the news anytime soon. No, no, not tonight. I don't really have any much say in that, but I can't, I can't do that. Do you want me to take you out to the lobby and you can go to the bathroom and then text your wife and stuff, talk to them? I don't want to go outside. Yeah, I don't want to go outside. Just watch the press people around. Yeah, I'll see them out there while you're with her. You want your wife? You want to take your wife with you? Yeah. We're going to try to do our best to make sure that we, uh, you know, we don't stand to gain anything by broadcasting any of this. That's not what law enforcement is ever really about. So we're going to try our best to handle that as discreetly as possible. But they're pretty good at what they do, too. Is it not from North Bob? You probably not from around here, neither are you? Are you? Uh, I've only been here a few years. Okay. Yeah. Don't go find a lawyer or something for not a public defender or somebody else. All of their planning was ultimately useless, as Ronnie left of his own volition, which is a bit funny. So if you're for it, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, I think we have a picture of, is it Survey 319? I think we have a picture. Um, kind of walk you through that. I'm sure you have a ton of questions for us about, you know, how your night, month, and week is going to look. Um, so Tammy, I was just telling him I wanted to show him that picture. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how the rest of the night's going to go. Um, that looks familiar to you. What is that? It's the BRC survey through Okay. Where about the Shanann and the girls? How old is this picture? Today. Last today. Found 
just in the kitchen. I don't want their blankets or anything. Where did their blankets and their toys and stuff go? Probably a little way the end or something right here. Where did you set them or put them? That was right here with that. So how did you dig this out? I'm assuming that's under dirt. How did you dig that? It's a shovel in the truck. It's still with it. It's like a work shovel. Is it still there? How was Shanann touched? Sure, in the north. So she got in the bed with. Do you remember what color her shirt was or underwear? I think sure it was either black or gray. Or it was probably blue. How much time passed, do you think, from the time that she was back in the bed until you put him in the truck? We're talking minutes, hours, something else. From when, I left, from when I left the house. Yeah, like from when you got her in the bed to when you put her in the truck. How long did that, how long time was that? So like from when I put her in my truck, from, from the bed to the truck, yeah, from your master bed to the truck. Yeah. Minutes. Okay. Because you talked about covering it off or something. No. And she. Is there anything else about anything out here that has stuff that you've left in certain spots, or are you sure their blankets and toys aren't going to be in there as well? Not because it was right here with this. Can you do me a huge favor and just write your name on the bottom? Just so I know that we didn't make those marks. I'm just going to write the date on it, okay? May 15, 18, and 556. Was she wearing, was your wife wearing any shorts or pants or anything just under her? Okay. Do you remember what uh, they look like? Blue. Okay. Um, okay. And the girls, do you remember what their pajamas were? They're both. Both nightgowns. Okay. Celeste, I think, was that pink one with the, like, Curves on it. Okay. I think those was there in the corner, I believe, on it or something. Okay. So it sounds like, I mean, it feels like to me now we know pretty well how to go get them. Is there anything else we need to know? something and then lower something down to get them? They're like, it's just a hatch on the top and they're like 20 foot tanks. How far down are they? That, wherever the food level is in the tank, I'm not sure. Okay. What was it when you were there? I don't know. I didn't okay. I wasn't looking for that. Okay. All right. You may go out there or no? I don't think so. Would you prefer not to? I didn't know if you needed help going, getting there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think once we got that picture, cause we didn't really know um, how much uh, about the location that the other police officers knew. But it sounds like they knew somehow right, right how to get there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
get to 319. So, and I think that's how they got that picture. Does your, um, does your nanny cam, do you have nanny cam, right? It's a monitor. A monitor. Is it, is it a video one? It's like it cycles back and forth. Between what? Bell and CC to run. Oh, okay. Okay. Is there any chance it records? No? Okay. I'm just wondering, what do you think, what do you think ultimately made um, Shanann snap? Just knowing that I had an affair or and she knew, she just needed me to admit it, and I would admit it. Yeah. Okay. So we just started talking about, um, I asked if there's any chance that the nanny cam could have recorded Shanann doing what she did. Um, and then we kind of, we were just getting into, you know, what Chris thinks about why she snapped. Mm -hmm. um, she's just distressed from knowing about the other girl. Knowing, but she didn't really know, right? I mean, in her heart, she thought she she knew. She just wanted me to admit it. Can we talk about a couple tough things? Um, I think we need to get it out of the way and just really get it out, um, just to make sure you have every chance to explain exactly what happened, and we have every chance to ask questions. Um, so the conversation happened. You go downstairs. She's still upstairs. And then you see what? I hear this commotion upstairs. Just I go you know, like, more like that. Okay. Didn't think anything of it. Sure. Maybe walking around. Yeah. Maybe one of the kids is getting up or yeah. a fisherman got up or something. Yeah. Okay. Can't think of it. And you're just packing everything up. You're ready to go. So I go back up and just talk to her again, maybe go fast. And go into their room, her master bedroom. She wasn't in there. Okay, you went there first? Yeah. And why did you go up again? Just to go up and talk to her again. Oh, okay. So it's not as though that noise made you run up, you just stopped. No, I didn't. Okay. I didn't the register with me for that. <coughs> I looked in the monitor and it was on Bella. And where is the monitor? Where's the screen that you look at? Is it up or downstairs? It's upstairs. Okay, so you go upstairs, look at the monitor. Yeah, the monitor up inside the bed. Oh, you're a master bed. Okay, yeah. all right. Inside the bed. So she's, she's not in her bed. It's still right there. Okay. She wanted to look at it. And then it was on Bella. Her covers were pulled back. And she was just called out laying there. And then it cycled over. So they got three, four, five second like interval between when they when it cycles from room to room. And I cycled over to see his room. That's when I saw her on top of her, that's when I ran in. Okay. Um, so can we talk about again it's very, very hard to talk about, but it's good to make sure that we understand. We don't want anything to be um, incorrect or inaccurate or or anything like that. Um, was your wife on top of Cece? What, what did that look like? I mean, was she straddling her? Okay. And where were they? On the bed. On the bed. And so your wife was on top. Is it? I mean, was she? That's that's when I was walking up from the back. Okay. I've seen something from the back. Yeah. Okay. But she was doing this. It looked, it looked like it was like this. Yeah. Okay. And then was Cece? Face up, face down, what? Off to the other side. Oh, she was laying on her side. Okay. And that's when I pulled her off. Okay. She, 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 no, she was limp and she was blue. Okay. There was no movement at all. Okay. She was limp and blue or limping and blue? Limp and or blue. Limp and blue. Okay. It's like her body was like, right? You pick her arm up and it turns into balls. Okay. Um, and then what happened? I looked at her and I just got on top of her and you want to talk about Shanann? Did the same thing. Okay. Did you have to knock her down? No. She was already on the ground? I was like, I just pulled her off on the bed. Oh, kind of one move.
Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's not as though you. No, I didn't pull the right off. No. Like I went, I pulled her down. Like I did that. I, I didn't know. I lost it. Sure. Okay. So she was laying on the ground. Or on the bed. On the bed. Yeah, like when she was on top of the seat, I saw what was happening. Oh. I pulled her. Went down. I was on the bed. How did the bed? What kind of? Try to get a full queen, you know? I think it's a. Yeah, it's probably a queen of some sort. Okay. I have a picture of it some more. I think. Okay. So, where was the last? She was all the way to the top. To the top? Yeah. Now I went in. I pulled Shannon down. It was a cross place. Like so she was laying this way. way. That's how it was. Okay. I want the key room. Mm -hmm. So then, is this picture as you're standing in the doorway to go in? What is that? Is that where I And then, so were they closer to this side or this side? She usually sits in the middle. Okay. And then, so your wife is right on top of her. You get to see that. And then, did you pull her this way or that way? Or so to where her head was on this side, right over here. Yeah. On the on the left, you're looking at it. Okay. Did you put it fine? I I, I I lost it so much that it didn't feel like she did. Okay. You're a pretty strong dude. Um. Um, did she, was she yelling? Was she screaming? Was she talking? Was she scratching you? Nothing. Uh, I, I didn't feel, I just, uh, I just felt such anger that not, nothing, I didn't feel anything. Okay. All right. Like if she did, nothing, nothing's on me. Was it quick? Was it slow? Was it, that's so numb. It felt like it was, it was over. Okay. Just, Okay. Fast. Okay. So like, I would, is it possible her neck's broken? No, no. So okay. I've never broken a bone, so I don't, I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, was it a choke like this, or was it like a headlock? A choke. Okay. Right. Can you put your hand out like you had your hand? Like that. Like that. And your wife, you saw her with one hand or two hands? I just came up from the back. I couldn't really, like, tell. Oh, well, she's on top of her. And the monitor's not, like, color. It's black and white. It's what yeah. nighttime is black and white. Okay. It's dark. Do you, because you went up the stairs, right, to talk to mm -hmm. Shanann again? And then, did you think it was weird that she saw in the room where you mm -hmm. left her? Mm -hmm. So I walked in, looked around, saw the monitor, and I saw Bella. And so she started to see pretty fast, and that's when I saw that. Mm -hmm. and did you have any inkling that um, between the time that you finished the talk and the time that you found Shanann choking, she, she had no inkling she was going to do it? Or, I think both of those kids more than. No. Okay. And people, people in my family have always said she's unstable. My friends have said she's unstable, but I never like would have thought in a million fucking years. Who says she's unstable? My family, my friend Mark, people that have seen her around me. This bears some discussion because Chris is positing that Shanann was a deeply unstable, mentally ill person, even though that doesn't fall in line with how she was described by the majority of their friends and family. His friends, his family, the people he knew separately away from Shanann, they didn't like her. They would all agree that she was a mean bitch and too controlling over Chris's life. She made fun of Chris, said she wasn't usually attracted to guys like him when they first got together, and therefore, it isn't her character to have killed their children. When Chris's mother was interviewed after his confession, when she was given the platform to tell the world what Shanann did that proved she was an untrustworthy, unstable person, the most she said 
was that Shanann joked about how Chris dressed, like a skater boy, when they first started dating. Meanwhile, the people they knew as a couple didn't see the signs of abuse or instability. So what is the difference? The difference is Chris. As we stated earlier, Chris would use Shanann as a scapegoat in nearly every situation. If something went wrong in their life, it was somehow her fault, even when it wasn't. He would frame her being in charge of the family finances as a symptom of her control issues, even when he admitted to putting them thousands of dollars in debt. If he couldn't go out with his friends, it was her fault, and so on. Any teenager who used their parents as an excuse not to hang out with someone or to get out of some commitment would understand what Chris had done. He had made her the ultimate excuse, blaming things on her, and giving his friends the impression that she was keeping him under lock and key, but that simply wasn't the case. It's notable that the people in Chris's life, the ones he kept away from Shanann, had this negative view of her. They believed Chris when he said it was her fault, because they didn't think he would lie about something like that. Meanwhile, the majority of their mutual friends were friends with her and adored her. Neither Tammy nor Graham believed Chris's version of events. Why that picture of her? Well, it doesn't look good. I'm not gonna lie. Looks actually pretty bad. Is it, is it possible that when we get these girls, you know, uh, Bella, Cece, and Shanann, is it possible when we get them um, that we're going to see um, anything other than the cause of death being her hands? No. Okay. And what I mean by that, and I should be very clear, is that um, it, it's some, some of it's hard to believe that your wife did it, uh -huh. right? You can imagine that. Uh -huh. Okay. So is it possible that maybe she um, did one, and then you got Shanann, so you did to Shanann what she did to one of your daughters, and then you had to just do it to the other one? No, no, no. Okay. So is there, that, that's not, no, that's just not what happened. No. Okay. Um, is it possible that, is there any other way where we might see your hands on the girl's neck? No. Lord, no. Okay. And you know what I mean? Because when we find their, their little bodies, oh, no. we're going to see the diameter of someone's hand yeah. and someone's fingers, right? So is it at all possible we're no. going to see yours? No. Okay. All right. And I know it's hard, and I know you're probably getting angry at my, my question, but we have to ask. Um, okay. What we had stated about Chris's priorities earlier is on display now. When asked what he's thinking about, how he is feeling after confessing to murdering his wife after she supposedly killed their kids, he begins by saying that he let everyone down. Their idea of him as a good person, a quiet, honest man, was fraudulent, and he is upset that they are no longer going to view him in that way. He's not upset because he was unable to protect his kids from a threat, or that he lost his family. That doesn't matter to him. He's upset that people will view him as a bad person, which they undoubtedly will. Every single time he has shown any kind of sadness in this interview, it has been selfish. He has no regard for the fact that he took anyone's life. He just cares that people will not like him for it. Everybody. Can I ask you another tough question? Can you just get it all on the table? When you see Shanann choking, strangling Celeste, and you get her off of Celeste, do you think um, about calling an ambulance? How come? I saw a CG in there blue and limp. Mm -hmm. I've never seen something like that in my life. I mean, she just like lay over, like nothing was, she wasn't moving at all. No gas, no breath. So, she was totally just blue. So Chris, I'm doing this job for a long time. I know. I, uh, I know a lot of about psychology and as far as like what people are thinking. And most parents will never even want to fathom that their kid, or their kid is dead. Even if their kid's stiff, blue, in bed, I mean, stiff, like, been dead all night, 
they still call an ambulance to see if someone can revive their child. And they, when the ambulance get the, gets there and they're like, gosh, their kid's been dead all night, like there's nothing we can do. And the parents are like, what are you, why are you not doing something? What are you talking about? So that's what I'm, that's what we're used to. So I just, that's why I want you to explain to me like what was going on in your head and... The very and last thought for what she, was, what she did, I just took over. But do you see that? I, that kind of I, see that. I, I see where you're coming from. Those parents would still try and call. I see where you're coming from. I would hate for Shanann to get a bad rap if she didn't have anything to do right. with it. You know it's not fair. No, no. It's not fair. Like enough bad stuff has happened. Well, like we need to stop the bad stuff from happening. Tammy has begun to put pressure on Chris and to assert that his new story makes no sense. This will be incredibly alarming to Chris, who would have felt relief for the first time in seven hours after he thought his new version of events was being believed. He spent nearly half the day being told that they knew he was lying, and for the past hour or so, some of that weight was being removed from his shoulders. But now Tammy is putting it back on, telling him once again that they know he's not being truthful. Going so far as to say that Shanann doesn't deserve the blame will be equally as effective on Chris, given that less than an hour earlier, she said that she wouldn't be surprised if Shanann had hurt the girls because, and I quote, chicks are crazy. So, do you want to tell me the truth? That is, that is the truth. Is that the truth? I want to make sure. So you're good with the public knowing that Shanann killed her daughters? I did not hurt these girls. Are you okay with the public knowing that Shanann killed Yes, because I did not hurt these girls. Chris, I'm not sure I believe you. So Graham is close, and many other people have theorized the same scenario, especially after people realized that it was Chris who sent Shanann the picture of the doll with the blanket over its body. But that's not what occurred. Though I don't expect anyone in the audience to have gone through what Chris is going through literally, many of you would likely have experienced a situation where an authority figure is telling you what they believe you had done. There is a certain feeling of dread and anxiety when the details match up the way they do here. But Chris would have felt some amount of pleasure or relief when Graham got the details wrong. He is asserting that he believed that the girls were killed first. Prior to Shanann coming home, would have made Chris feel like he had gotten something right that night and had properly hid some facet of his crime. And that's what we're kind of left, that's what we have to believe because it just doesn't make sense. I mean, to her point, if I walked in and my kid was decapitated, I'd call an ambulance, mm -hmm. right? Knowing there's no hope. 
it just it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't add up. So either you're this monster who says, yeah. I just want this young hot girlfriend, so I'm gonna kill everyone and hope it works out or something. So I think we're very, very close to the truth, but not quite there yet. So if you're not that monster... I'm not a monster. I didn't kill my babies. Okay. So, tell us what actually happened. I told you what happened. I know, but, you know, we're getting later into the day. We've done this a few times, and we, we talk. Then we show you a little bit of what we're working with, some evidence, some facts that we know, and then we, we kind of get our way to the truth. So, so the truth. Okay. Everything I've told you. It's the truth. So what's going to happen when their cause of death comes back to you? Or the girl's not going to. Okay. You sure? I'm 100% positive it's not going to come back to me. Well, who's it going to come back to? She never was on top of CC. Okay. What are you hoping to say? I just want the truth. That is the truth. And what about Bella? Bella was laid out, sprawled on her bed. Okay. And I saw Shanae on top of Cece Star ran in there. Okay. And what happens when a coroner looks and says, sees your fingerprints on her neck? It's not going to be my fingerprints. Okay. What is it going to be? It's going to be Shanae. For sure. Well, we don't know about Bella, right? We don't know about Bella. Bella, it's, it's just, I didn't see Jeanette on top of her. Okay. That's the commotion I heard upstairs. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming. Okay. Why take their bodies out of the house and bury them? I was scared. I didn't know what else to do. Okay. Nothing, nothing, nothing was gonna, I, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Scared. I honestly didn't know what to do. Scared of what? Of what everything was going to look like. There was, my two babies were gone, mm -hmm. and I, I just did that to my wife. And I was the only one left in the house. What do you expect is going to happen? Yeah. It did look bad, right? It looked, I mean, this was a nightmare. Yeah. Okay. Do you think as many problems as you've had with Shanann at the end of the day? She seemed like she was a pretty good mom, right? I was a pretty good dad as well. Chris takes direct offense at the idea that Shanann was a good mom. Tammy and Graham have been hyping his negative feelings about his wife up from the beginning of the interviews, agreeing that she was controlling and demanding, asking him to do the laundry sometimes and to take care of his kids when she was away. But the moment they stop doing that, the moment they note that Shanann was an extremely attentive mother who the girls loved so much that when she left for a business trip, they became inconsolable. He has to bring up that he was also a good father. He needs Shanann to be viewed as bad, as unstable, to be seen as the lesser parent. Because if they view her as a good, attentive mother who would never hurt her children, that would make him look guilty, which he is. Perception is extremely important to Chris. He is fine being perceived as quiet and weak, being bulldozed by a controlling wife. In fact, he loves that view of himself because it gives him an easy out for any issue in his life. But when push comes to shove, that's not who he actually was. You never really know a person until you don't know a person. I just would hate for someone who can't defend themselves. Like Shanann and Bella and Celeste. Like, I mean, if, if, if you're not being truthful about who took their lives, like, that's on them, too. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do that to them. I'm not doing that to them. I'm just saying, I mean... No, 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 I'm not doing that to them. I do think you were a good dad. I think you're. I think Shanann was a good mom. I think you guys were doing everything you could possibly do for those girls. I mean, look at them. Why didn't you put Shanann in the tanks?
I didn't know what to do. But it's How far down is she? I don't know, like, like two feet maybe. How long did it take you to dig that? No. Give me an idea. Does anyone ever like go up this ladder and like look in tanks? Mm -hmm. So, how are you gonna avoid that? Or is it you that does that? Anybody that goes to the location. How often is that done that those tanks are checked? And just there. Are making enough oil or whatnot once a week, maybe. So do you want someone to find them? I know what else could take them. I didn't. That was the location I was going out to that morning. Anyway. And, and that's, I didn't know what else to do. So you weren't thinking that far ahead? No. Okay. Yesterday when you were talking, um, and again, this is before we kind of got to this um, moment today, you mentioned that you know, we were talking, you said, I don't know where they are, I don't know where they are, and then you said something along the lines of, whatever happened to them is act of pure evil. What did that mean? Is this it's the evil that I saw when I walked behind and she had and she was on top of the seat. And I felt evil for I didn't see that. Okay. So, one other thing that doesn't make sense to me is, well, I don't know. Can you walk me through again? When you walked in, what did she look like? What did Shanann look like? All you saw was her back. Was it the same shirt that you buried her in? Same underwear? And then was she wearing pajamas? Shanann? Yeah, no, that's, that's what she sleeps in. Oh, she sleeps in her underwear. Okay, and no pajamas, no shorts, nothing like that. So then, when you grab her, um, just as is, that's how she gets to the truck, that's how she gets to the site. Okay. So did Shanann ever go to bed? Like when I, I put her back in the bed? No, no, like when she got home. Did any of that happen where she, really, she got in yeah. bed and then you woke her up at four? Like is all yeah. that true? Because it looks like there's some purchase of some hair care products at like 2.30 in the morning. Do you know about that? Hair care products? And her credit card was denied? No. You said you don't really use the credit card, so the private not credit card, card, no. Would you have bought hair care products at two thirty in the morning that mm -hmm. morning? No. Did she get mad at you because there's no money when she woke up? Like was that part of the uh, that was a, this is the first I've heard of that. Okay. As far as hair care products in the car green and I Okay. And I'm not lying about that, I'm just that's what I'm asking but uh, that is so Something that came up. Is there any reason that she would have a black eye, Shanann? No. Not from a slap or a punch or nothing like that? Is that okay. Punch or slap her. Is there any reason she would have a stab mark on her body? No. Okay. And no other reason for death? The coroner's not going to find rat poison in her stomach. Okay. The only way that she died, she was living, breathing, wasn't living, breathing after your hands on her neck. Okay. What were you talking to Nikki about before your wife got home? Before she got home? You talked for like several hours. I mean, we talk a lot. 
conversations, random conversations. We talk a lot. Does Nikki know about any of this? Seriously? No, she doesn't. No, like, I mean, she knows, like, with, from the news and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Anything else? You can share with her anything? Does she know your wife was pregnant? She does now. And I told her that. She didn't know at the time? How come you didn't tell her? I was scared, too. Felt so, like, you know, like, she wouldn't even, like, go on a date with me. And she knew that, so it's... Did she know you were married with kids? Yes. Okay. But just not pregnant. Yes. I told her that, you know, like, we were act we actively tried before we met. Oh, trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Okay. But she knew that. Um, you can imagine that when we go talk to people going forward, everyone's going to try to distance themselves from any of this. Yes. And so it, what's going to happen when Nikki says, no, it was our plan to kill everyone and run off together. Chris is once again shocked that law enforcement is going to talk to his mistress, even though infidelity is a significant motive for spousal homicide. So can we get ahead of that for you? Can we get all of that out right now? I mean, so are you sure she's not going to say, oh, I kind of knew he was going to kill him? No. She's not going to say no? no. Okay. Um, and she's not going to say, boy, we were making plans about buying a house or an apartment. She's going to say that? No. Like, really she really like once I have my own place, like we could, you know, like hang out more. Okay. So after the separation, after that dust settled, then you have availability to go see Nikki. You guys have talks like that? Yeah, I mean, like she generally like me. Okay. Please don't put her name out there. And so she's been through enough in her life. Now. Chris begging them not to put her name out would be sweet and considerate, but her name would be put out in the news because of his actions. He directly involved her in this, and though there is no definitive evidence that she had anything to do with the murders, because of their relationship, there is a significant amount of people online who believe she was the one who told Chris to kill his family. Nicole's life as she knew it was destroyed by Chris, but he refuses to acknowledge that. He has harmed the people in his life by his own actions, but every time he has the opportunity to take responsibility for what he's done, he pawns the blame off on someone else or something else. When Shanann was alive, it was her. Before that, it was his mother. And in this situation, it's the goddamn investigation. If Nicole's life is adversely affected by the murders, it's because of law enforcement, not him. It's just like that. We, we never try to put out well, I'm just not like the friends that they got from them an affair. They would, they would drag her through the mud. I don't yeah. want that. Yeah. We're certainly not going to try to make that happen. It's not going on any of this. I know, there's press finds ways. That's everything. So what do you think about everything now? Do you feel sorry for what you did? I wish I would have lost the control and got on top of the shenanigans and did that. And then did that. What? To the left of the world yeah. thing? Yes. So after we, after we look at their bodies, we're going to have a lot more questions. Um, things are going to be different then, but if you're willing, we'd love to talk to you then too. You did really good today, Chris. Really good. I think you 
you had about 24 hours of just a hellish nightmare thrust upon you, and you know you certainly knew what you did, but I think you took a lot of steps to make it better today. Sorry I left you last night, and sorry I did you today. Not okay. I thought you were here for a reason. Well, there's a reason why I didn't that I came in because mm -hmm. that's the reason why I didn't come in with a lawyer either. So it's like kind of just, just gonna happen. So I appreciate that. You know, eventually they were going to find them out there. So, I mean, it was kind of inevitable. And then you would have just been sitting at home waiting for that moment to happen. And then what? Then what does it look like? There's many people that say that you're an amazing guy and you would never do anything bad and never has never lost your temper and you know all those people that say that about you. There's just as many that would say that about Shanann. So we're gonna struggle with that for a while. We're struggling with it right now. I'll be honest. I know. I'm a mom. Anybody would. Chris doesn't usually interject while other people are talking like this. We've watched over 10 hours of him talking to the police, but he rarely ever cuts people off like this. But he really does not want to hear anyone compliment the woman he killed, or hear about how she was a great mom. How do we prove best that she ended it? Marks, like they weren't smothered, no, they, they, you think? I don't know. I shouldn't have been smothered, no. And Bella, I don't know, but she, she, she was on top of her, and her head was inside. And there was no pillow on top of her. I didn't see her on the camera. I didn't see her on top of her. Why were there sheets in the trash in the kitchen? Because uh, those are the same ones out there. The relevant part of the investigation ends there. Following the interview, Chris was arrested and charged with Shanann's murder. Though they knew he'd been responsible for all three, they wanted to make sure the charges stuck before they moved forward. Shanann, Bella, and Celeste's bodies were found shortly thereafter, and when the public was made aware of how they were found, the majority were horrified. Even people who had been staunchly on Chris's side believing that the MLM mom had deserved to die, thought that how the girls were disposed of was horrific. Nearly a week later, Chris was formally charged with three counts of first-degree murder, unlawful termination of pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased human body. The affidavit was made public, and the heinous details of Chris's crimes were revealed, and it became obvious that he was the only person who could have killed his children. However, for the next two months, Chris's legal team and family stated he was innocent. They blamed Shanann for the girl's murders, and said they would be fighting for Chris every step of the way. On November 6th, he would ultimately take a plea deal, in exchange for pleading guilty to the murders. The death penalty was taken off the table. He would admit to his lawyers and his family that it was him, not Shanann, that had killed the children. But his mother refused to believe it. He was given five life sentences, without the possibility of parole. But that is not where the case ends. As we have covered, shortly after he was sentenced, Chris would speak to the FBI again, going over the crime in detail. He also wrote to multiple people, providing further information as to how he destroyed his family. But more on that in a later video. Thank you so much for watching our coverage of this case. We'll be back soon with more content. If you want to see more true crime videos, feel free to subscribe. If you have any suggestions for cases you want us to look into, leave them in the comments down below, and remember to stay safe.